and welcome to another episode of 72 Pin Connector. With us this week, we have Tom Webster. Howdy, everyone. And Adam Jordan. Hello, hello. So, don't you guys just love technology? Oh, I sure do. Ah, uh, I quit. I'm retiring. I'm going to go be Amish. <laughs> So just for full disclosure, we just redid this intro because as I started the stream five minutes ago, I had a network spike. And we thought we were live because it told me I was still streaming and you guys were sitting in the dark. So we had we had probably the best 100 seconds of content that no one will ever see because it is now lost to the ether of the Internet. But, But, you know, just just imagine like the, the best content you could possibly imagine that would bring tears to your eyes and and that's what it was it was amazing <laughs> we can't redo it though, because it was all really in the moment stuff but we yeah, promise absolutely. it was amazing yeah yes. it really was totally uh so how are you guys doing this week Ugh. Ugh. that's Ugh. not good I don't, that's not what i like to hear no that no. sounds bad br has been kicking my ass this week so you know, you know BR. You know how there's VR, virtual reality, and then there's AR, augmented reality. BR is boring reality. And I've just had like a slew of stupid shit. Like work oh, shit, no. outside of work shit, just shit everywhere in not fun shit, just boring drawl shit. So I have played very, very few games this week. Very few games. I hate when work gets boring. Yeah, uh, it's the worst. You, you yeah. had some good pizza though. Yeah, I did pizza that night. I did have some fucking fantastic pizza. Yeah. Okay. Irk, I gotta explain this shit. All right. Adam and I had some had some pizza. We had the Murica pizza. It's this tiny little place next to me that just opened up. They take a meat lovers pizza, and then okay. they take a second meat lovers pizza, and okay. they take these two pizzas, and then they invert the pizza on top of the other pizza and bake it like a big old pizza pie. It's a fucking pizza sandwich with all the meat you would ever want. Yes. 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 It's called the New York yes. stuffed pizza. And oh my God, it's so delicious. It takes yes. them twice as long to bake it because the thing is so chock full of shit. Well, so, it's mathematically two pizzas as well. So that's true. That's so true. technically, or not technically, but every time I've seen these type of pizzas with the covered top, they don't have yeah. as much sauce on the inside and you have to dip. Does this have the sauce too? Oh, it's got oh, it the sauce. sauce. Yeah. Oh, it was dripping yes. with yes. sauce and grease and oh my God. It was, it was so, so good. I don't want to say terrible, but the concept is terrible and it's terrible for your body. But it's oh, so, yeah. so good. I, I gained probably six pounds and I only <laughs> ate one piece. Yeah. So you guys filling. know where I live. You know my address. Just go ahead and mm-hmm. ship me out one. Okay. Just I will flash I freeze that. it, oh, yeah, put it in sure. dry ice, and send me one. <laughs> you know, they're not paying us to say this, but Gino's East of Chicago Pizza will actually deep freeze a pizza and ship it to you. Nice. You can they're buy it in the grocery us. store. I'm just very happy. They've got frozen pizzas in the grocery store, too. Yeah, we Ooh. bought those the one time you and d came into town for yeah. land. Yeah, it's mm. good. Yeah, they're it's pretty legit. Probably the best frozen pizza I've had. It's obviously not as good as being there, but, you know. It's almost yeah. as good as the deep it's dish good. I made. Uh, you know? I know Kroger carries it. Uh, Meyer carries it. I don't know about Walmart, but I don't go there. Yeah, my, Walmart. My, my guilty pleasure it. frozen pizza is Red Baron Thin Crust. Just get that good old pizza crisp to it. <sighs> yeah. I know they're not, they're not good. They're not I the worst, them. though. They're not they're the not. worst. If we're going to go small or thin pizzas, just give me the party pizzas. A buck a no. piece. I'll get no, like three of those here. fuckers. Have some self-respect. Uh, right. Dude, it's like, it's like being back in high school getting cafeteria pizza. It's not that bad. I hated <sighs> cafeteria pizza. The fact that you have to say it's hated. not that bad means it is that bad. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. no, correction. Now, are you saying that it's actually bad or in the terms of the good pizza you've had, it's bad? Because I've never had bad pizza. No, I will just, honestly say that. Okay, the, uh, the worst pizza I've had is still decent because it's pizza, right? I don't think I I agree with you. I've never had bad pizza, but on the range of pizzas, cafeteria cardboard pizza reaches the bottom. Yeah, (laughs) it's a step below Little Caesars, which tastes more like spaghetti than it does pizza. Yeah, but those little Tostitos party (laughs) pizzas, man, you just throw them in the microwave. They're not crisp. 
You and just, you microwave it? What yeah, are you girl, doing? Oh, Fini- let me finish. Let no, me finish. No. What you this, do, you this take- concludes. <laughs> this concludes our episode of Food Podcast Pin Connector. Tune in next week when we berate Irk for microwaving things he should be baking. No, no, no. So you take it out. It's still a little, like, foldy. It's not crisp. And then you f- put a shit ton of hot sauce, a lot more cheese, and, like, some spare pepperoni you have it. Fold it up and just eat it like a fucking taco. Pizza it taco. Is amazing. <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to have to do like an extra podcast where, where we yeah. go into this and actually try to eat this monstrosity that you've created. It's good. But that's that's an entirely different episode. Actually, one that I think would appeal to our core audience of people who sit around and eat microwave pizza that should be baked. I think we're just as passionate about food as we are video games. Probably more passionate about food. At least I'm more passionate about food. And for the record, to end the debate, Buck Masterson just put it in perfect words. Pizza rolls are better than any frozen pizza you buy. Well, yeah. I mean, that's just, you know, that's like the fourth Newtonian law. Yeah, you've got like the three (laughs) physics laws. And then the fourth says, yeah, pizza rolls are always going to be better than frozen pizza. So uh, my old roommate and I, he had this huge kick about deep frying things. We would actually deep fry our pizza rolls. Oh, God. so good. So good. Oh, my nice God. Crispy. Nice. Oh, God. So crispy. It only took like a minute and a half, two minutes. Just like, bam, it was good. You have to watch because it got a little hot. But yeah, so good. <laughs> I'm going to need a deep fryer. That settles it. I'm getting a deep fryer. I'm glad I don't have one anymore because that shit will kill you. It cooks quick and it cooks delicious. And it's terrible but, for you, so it's awful. There's, there's something to be said for, you know, eating, like, bland vegetables every day of your life and having to live through, like, 120 years of that shit. But you could eat deep-fried pizza rolls every day and have the best 15 years of your life. Right? <laughs> that trade-off is worth it to me. Uh, I don't no, know. No, 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 we'll, no, no. we'll let that one we'll let it slide. We'll, we'll, we'll get into this discussion at a later time when I show yes. you that, um... No. Anyway. Tom, so... Video You've games. been doing some gaming, video games. right? I, I video gamed. Um, that wasn't about food. I did not play Cool Spot or Pepsi Man. Uh, I, I, did, I did play some, some actual video games. Um, so I did play a little bit of Dark Souls. Still stuck on Ornstein and Smo. They're fucking hard. I have been working out strategies in my head and testing them out before like actually executing it. Because executing the strategy takes humanity, which is a consumable resource. I don't want to have to farm that, so I'm trying to get all my ducks in a row and figure out my game plan before I just go full force on it. Um, But, uh, other than that, I have been playing uh, Zelda, A Link to the Past, in bed, right before I fall asleep. Usually knock out, you know, a dungeon, or, or at least getting to a dungeon before bed. It's a great bedtime game. I'm familiar yeah. with it, I love it. To me, it's relaxing, even the hard parts are pretty relaxing. And yeah. after I beat that dungeon, I'm like, yeah, I'm satisfied. I just made progress. My, I feel like my life is now going somewhere because I got another pendant and then I can go to bed happy <laughs> and realize, I wake up and realize, oh, my God, this is my life. I play yeah. Zelda before bed now. Um, I never did play that or I never did finish it, but that's probably the Zelda game I've played more than any other. It gets hard as fuck at the end. Yeah, it's it's so good, though. It's so good. Um, but other than that, uh, I, I did a bad thing, uh, and I found a WoW private server that's not run by Blizzard that I don't pay for that. Uh, but here's, here's the kicker. Here's here's the kicker. Um, (laughs) it, I really hate World of Warcraft. I hate what it's become. Everything after Wrath of the Lich King is just dog shit. It's literally after Wrath of the Lich King, it, the whole thing is a fast track conveyor belt to get you to you know, whatever the new expansions content is as fast as possible. That's not why I play MMOs. I play MMOs to be bored, to put on a movie in the background that I like and you know, sit and like binge Netflix while it's clicking on shit because I feel like I'm being unproductive if I just binge Luke Cage all day. So <laughs> it's a vanilla server. No expansions, no nothing, straight up like 1.0 World of Warcraft. And it's everything I've dreamed of. I've probably played five hours, maybe. So it's not even like I'm like super into it, but it worked well. It's vanilla. 
Uh, I know it's totally piracy. <laughs> it's totally against the terms of service. But Blizzard doesn't really give me an option to play, you know, the first 20 levels of vanilla WoW. Yeah, there's a free trial mode, but it's got all the expansions and all the bullshit. I just I don't want to do that. So I, I will say I hate the model of WoW where you buy the game. You pay a subscription, and as soon as you stop paying the subscription, you no longer can play the game you bought. I on, hate that model. On, on one hand, uh, it, it's weird because no other game works that way. On the other hand, it's an MMO, and those worlds take an ungodly amount of resources, like human resources, not just server time. Like, people have to go in and keep these things running and curate them and moderate them and they're, they're big, expensive worlds. And even, even the private servers have got donation pages where they're like, hey, we only need $4,000 this month. Like, holy shit, you run a dinky little private server and you need 4K? All right. Well, that's them pocketing like 3.5. But uh, either way. Not necessarily. I mean, this, this shit gets expensive. But um, they're not making content. They're just hosting. But like yeah. RuneScape. RuneScape has it right. If you're going to do subscription, do subscription. The game is free. If you're going to pay for a game, pay for a game, no fucking subscriptions. Doing both and is fucking evil. That's why I, I really do like the Guild Wars MMO model where, you know, I paid 60 bucks for the like collector's edition thing when it was on sale and I just have it. Now, if I want all the new content in the expansion, I can buy that. And now, you know, the base game's free, but I don't have to pay a subscription. Uh, the, and really the only reason I went back to WoW instead of firing up Guild Wars, because I've already got Guild Wars legally, uh, is because Blizzard games are really good at the nostalgia trap. They are excellent at the nostalgia trap, and I love vanilla World of Warcraft. I mean, that was, that was years of my childhood spent playing WoW and Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King, and, you know, then after that I was like, wow, they've ruined this, and, and I left. And for the well, record, I've already received two messages of people you've already pissed off by calling the current wild dog shit. Yeah, <laughs> no I, I know. Bullshit. No bullshit. Yeah. 50% I, of our listening audience right now has contacted me <laughs> being pissed off at you. <laughs> that's, that's okay. And I, I, know, I know it's a controversial statement. Uh, I, you know, wow prints money. It wouldn't if people didn't like the game for some reason. Uh, but I really don't like it. And, and, you know, I'm not just being contrarian. That's, there's a huge following of people that say Vanilla WoW is one of, if not the best version of that MMO. Um, and I, there are plenty of great, valid, technical reasons why Blizzard doesn't stand up a Vanilla WoW server. It's hard to do. Backporting security fixes and architecture changes, are, it's just... You know, hard, if not impossible for what? Maybe the six people, including myself, to to pay them 10 bucks to jump in. Yeah, no, that's not worth it. There's no business case there. So I get it. But, yeah, that's that's what I did. And I I will do what I always do with WoW and I will get super into it for a week or two and then completely drop it for two or three years. Um, But then uh, earlier this week, before real life came to a crashing halt, uh, I played some Sonic 3 uh, on stream, nonetheless, and uh, it was it was fun. I like Sonic 3. The only thing is between the emulator and the wireless controller, there was just enough input lag that I looked like uh, I looked like some idiot. Well, I can't even say idiot <laughs> child because myself as an idiot child was really good at Sonic 3. Yeah. I, I looked like a <laughs> dumb version of the idiot child that is myself playing Sonic 3. because. <laughs> I just kept making stupid, stupid ass mistakes. It was bad. Yeah. So I've been locked in a debate for about the last week. So I made a statement that I understand may have been overstepping, but it's kind of how I feel that I say Sonic is better than Mario. And I'm talking one, two, three knuckles versus one, two, three world. I'm not talking the expansion. Once you get past that, Mario just wipes the fucking ground with Sonic because the new Sonics are garbage. Everyone knows that. Well, yeah. But my coworker, or former coworker, was trying to tell me that the Sonic games weren't good. And that got me tilted. Because <laughs> I put a lot of time in those games. So I don't know how okay. you guys stand on it, but I honestly preferred Sonic over Mario. 
I went to different platformers for different reasons. I'm going to give the the bog standard answer. When I wanted precision platform, when I wanted a legit platforming game, I went to Mario. When I wanted a fun romp that was just fast and running through loops and listening to some badass Michael Jackson synth music on a Genesis, I went to Sonic. Right? Sonic yeah. is a is just a rip roar and good time. And to be real, until you get to the very last stages, there's not a whole bunch of challenge in it, especially in the later games. But with Mario, there's always a decent difficulty curve to be had. So I, I went to him for different reasons. But mm -hmm. if we're if we're going to throw down like this, if we're going to fight this one out, Mario 3 is probably no, not even probably Mario 3 is the best platformer of all time, bar none. End of discussion. No. No, no, no. If you're going single <laughs> one off, single one off, fucking Vector Man for the Sega was better than Super Mario 3. Oh, I don't but know. But that's also because Vector Man got no fucking no, love. No, v Vector Man that was, was a overrated. Great game. It was a great what? game. It was a great game, but it was very overrated, especially for the time. Go to yeah, hell. For the time, <laughs> it was beautiful. Yes, it was beautiful, but that's the only reason people liked it. The game was good. It wasn't amazing. And the only reason people liked it is because it was a very, very pretty game, especially on the Genesis. But that's the majority of its its staying power is it was pretty. We're going to fight when it's, I get to like, Ohio. We're going to fight. <laughs> it's, it's like how people fondly remember Comic Zone on the Genesis, but they remember it because of the amazing art style. Right. The game wasn't even that good. Right. You can go back and play it today and it's it's just average at best. It's a shitty brawler. But it's still pretty. OK, and given what I just saw in chat, I'm letting you um, specify this. You mean best platformer of that era, right? Right? Maybe. I mean, <laughs> maybe because even even Mario 3 beats out Mario 64 for me because Mario 64 was like the epitome of it's still the epitome of 3D platforming. Uh, although Galaxy came really close because it was fucking amazing. But Mario 3 to me is still if you want something that is the core essence of a properly built platforming game, that's what you go to. It may be the pinnacle of what it did at the time, but there's already two people in chat calling out super fucking Meat Boy is way I better gonna... than Super Mario 3. I, I love Meat Boy, but let's be real. It is very much a one trick pony. Uh, it's, it's very much a Twitch based platforming game. Mario 3 is not. Mario 3 takes precision, but it's not at all Twitch based gaming. Uh, and you have to look at all the other stuff surrounding Mario 3, right? You've got the, the stupid little mini games, which, OK, whatever. But the levels all have varying paths through them. Uh, the vast majority of them. They've got different tracks. They've got hidden secrets. They've got I, I mean, once you break down Mario 3 and you fully understand the depth of the game, there's a lot to, to get through there. Meat Boy, while it's got some stuff, it's definitely got hidden areas and secrets and stuff to plow through. It's not exactly on the same level. I, yes. I think I agree with Tom with that. But I will say, I think Super Meat Boy is better than all of the Sonic games. And that's trying... And this is putting nostalgia aside because I have huge yeah. nostalgia for genesis era uh sonic games but i do think super meat boy was a better game i think i would give that to you i do yeah on a purely technical level meat boy is better constructed than sonic ever was yeah i just have the i loved sonic it was so but much I mean, faster yeah, oh, but yeah. I mean, let's 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 be real here if we're going on a purely musical level sonic 2 takes it Yes. Oh, nothing else. Nothing day. else will top it. Right? Chemical Sonic Plant Two is like. Zone. Okay, I don't oh want to start God. singing Casino that again. On... Night Zone. I don't oh, need to sing Sonic Two. We, two cast we talked about these in the last podcast. I yes, think. we did. We, we yes, do. We, we do have people. <laughs> we do have people in in chat naming some awesome games. Rayman Legends. Have you guys ever played that? No, no. I haven't. Oh, I I've heard it on those Gog. games are great, but I have not really played much of them. Oh, Rayman Legends is beautiful. It controls well. And I don't play platformers on PC. It, frankly, I hardly play platformers at all today anymore, unless I'm playing something mm -hmm. retro or Super Meat Boy. Um, but uh, Rayman Legends is just a great time. It's beautiful. The music is good. Everything's in sync. It's got great game feel. 
Um, DuckTales, of course, is a classic. DuckTales Remastered is fantastic, too. And um, goddamn Moonsong. I will say the nice thing about DuckTales Remastered, they fucking nailed the music. Oh, they really did. If they you're really not, did. If you're not familiar, Steam has some really good uh, trailers where they're going with the different design artists. With the, They have a trailer for art, a trailer for music, a trailer for gameplay. Ooh. And it, with the people talking about how they were trying to recapture what there was in the NES. That's it was, nice. It was really good. I, I love DuckTales. But, uh, of course, we, you know, in, in chat here, we've got... Fez, Braid, you know, some some of the indie darlings. Absolutely. Um, I, so Braid, I, I really like I want to gush over Braid so much, but yes. literally that was like the last three months of the last revision of the 72 pin connector podcast before we relaunched it. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying not to just make this the Braid podcast. Yeah. Um, I Inside liked... was fantastic, although the platforming elements were. Yeah, it, it was more of not really. I don't want to. I don't want to call it a walking simulator. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't a walking simulator. It was pretty close though. It had some puzzles. So, uh, how did you guys feel about Fez? Now, now that we're on the topic, and we can totally just blow this whole thing totally off course. How did you feel about Fez? I liked Fez a lot, but so, it was too much game for me. So I got to the point after about three, four hours of playing. Um, I realized I missed something back a ways on one of the worlds, and I would have had to traverse literally, li- linear, linearly. Say, thank you, <laughs> back to where I missed something. And I realized this game is so fucking huge. I don't have the patience for that. I never even understood the actual depth of the game. Yeah. So I never had that oh shit moment with it that right. I know it has because I've heard about it. I know it has that oh my god, this is ultra deep. Yeah, I got to the first uh, ending, if you want to call it that, and then you get something and start the game again, and it completely changes it. Completely yeah, changes it. I, I liked Fez. I, I didn't beat it. Uh, I liked Fez. I know all the stuff. I know it set the internet on fire trying to put together <laughs> that, you know, all the code and the language and stuff, and it's really cool. I just don't see Fez having enough staying power. I think it was... Fez is fireworks, right? It goes up, it's amazing for like five minutes, and then it's done, and that's all it has to offer. Not that it wasn't impressive, because it absolutely was, but after you're done, there's just no reason to go back. My problem Honestly, with it, I think that's fine. Yeah, oh no, no, I'm not saying every game has to have like multiple paths through and infinite replay value and a level editor, but I, I think Fez won't be remembered as fondly by history simply because it doesn't have the staying power. I think it's a period piece. Also, I felt the game was tedious at points. To me, it finally reached a point where it was tedious past reward, so I just stopped. And with platformers, I feel you have to walk that line because by nature, a platformer will be tedious. But if you make it too much that way, the players just want to say, fuck it, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I wish that the the rotating element was used a bit more than it was. It, it really was mostly a one trick pony. It was, hey, I'm going to rotate to find out where I can jump next. And that's really the only thing it did. I, I, I can see that being used in so many other ways in so many cool, awesome ways. But it just never happened. Um, so someone's yeah. asking about what we think, like, essentially the best game changer was for a platformer. Oh, and blast processing. Blast processing, clearly. Yeah, because, you know, memory shuffling. I just <laughs> watched a video today talking about that whole fucking thing. Oh, yes. my God. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Sega, when they were trying to pit the Genesis against the, uh, the NES and Super Nintendo, they were showing off Sonic. And, and the Genesis wasn't really that much more powerful than the the super nas right they were pretty on par with each other for the time um but sega in their marketing hype decided to call out blast processing and made that the focus of several commercials magazine ads and all this other stuff trying to say that it was so much faster and better than the super nintendo um both systems that's really the only console war i can call out and say yeah, these are like neck and neck. 
they both offer clearly different experiences. If you want RPGs and deep games, you go to the Super Nintendo. If you want like to tear people's spines out in Mortal Kombat and Sonic, you go to the Genesis. I've never torn a spine out in Sonic. What level was that? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. If you do the spin dash properly, Sonic like tears robot spines out. It's amazing. <laughs> It's oh, so he like actually gets the spine out of the little cute rabbit that was stuffed inside of it. Yeah. You've got to use and lock on technology. A Sonic fan. You've got to use lock on technology. You put in Sonic and Knuckles, then you put in Mortal Kombat Two on top of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> playing as Johnny Cage in Casino <laughs> Night Zone was the best thing I've ever done. You know that would have been an awesome Easter egg if they would have had oh, one of the yeah. Mortal Kombat's dock on top, and you actually play a Sonic levels like Sub Zero or Scorpion. <laughs> oh my god, that would be amazing. I did love playing as Knuckles in Sonic 2. That was fun. I thought that technology was amazing. At the time as a kid, I was like, how the fuck are they doing this? I literally just put Sonic 2 on here and I'm playing as Knuckles. How the <laughs> fuck is this magic working? Oh, my God. That was that was the most janky shit ever for the most stupid reasons ever that I learned later. But I thought it was the coolest thing on Earth. It wasn't really a janky reason. It was just a physical restriction. For those who don't know, the reason Sonic and Knuckles is a separate game from 3 is because there wasn't enough room on a Genesis cartridge, and Sonic and Knuckles was designed to be part of 3. It just couldn't fit on one cartridge. Yeah, Sonic 3 was going to be like the magnum opus of Sonic games. It was going to have all of the worlds of Sonic 3 and all of the worlds of Sonic and Knuckles all in one cartridge. So you've got this giant, massive, almost limitless Sonic game. But then they're like, shit, we can't fit it all in here so they had to split it up and then we got sonic and knuckles which without three was kind of i didn't really like it in in terms of sheer functionality it was a step backwards because sonic 3 could save your game sonic and knuckles couldn't but if you plug sonic and knuckles into sonic 3 then you could save your game you there see, was some I, weirdness i like the level design of knuckles and so- or sonic and knuckles probably the most Really? The actual level designs. There was a lot more interaction with the environment. That's true. And I that, really like that. That is true. I think 2 was probably my favorite, like, sheer level design. Uh, yeah. But 3 I had the most fun with. 2 Mostly was probably because my most fond. Snowboarding in Ice Cap Zone. <sighs> well, anyway. Sidebar sealed. Yes. Adam, <laughs> have you been doing any gaming this week? I have been doing some gaming this week. What gaming um, have you been doing? Aside from Rocket League, which obviously I play too much of, I played a game called Viscera Cleanup Detail. Visceral okay. Cleanup Detail? Visceral. No, I think it's Viscera. Is it Viscera? Is it? Is there an L? But either Whatever way, it is. What the fuck is that? There is too many people <laughs> that I Viscera. know that play that game. Really? You know a lot of people that play that? Okay. I think I it's, have the, same, it's my... the same people that you know that play it. And right. I have had this on my wish to. list for a year or more. Okay. And I, okay, so, so bring it on. What, what is All this? Right. All right, imagine a, an epic sci-fi battle. You're, you're plunging through the, the enemies. There's blood everywhere. But you take no part in that at all. <sighs> and you are a part of the cleanup crew that has to go in afterwards and clean everything up. <laughs> It's, that almost, it's basically it, chores the game. It sounds um, like a TF2 like Surgeon <laughs> Simulator kind of joke game. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely kind of a novelty game. Um, there's no like time limit. There's no real objectives. You, you've got like a broom and a mop. Uh, you wipe up the blood into the mop bucket, and there's a little gun that gets rid of bullet holes, and you got to throw all the body parts in the little disposable bins. <laughs> But can you craft uh, an ultra cleanup tool and like duct tape no. the broom to the other no. end of the mop so you have one tool that does no, both? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Spin no, them around. No crafting system. Um, it is multiplayer. The, the the whole appeal of the game is the fact that it's not a good game, but you can all <laughs> jump in there with your friends and it's just kind of a novelty. You know, we're all making jokes like, "Hey, get back to work. This is not. This is serious work. This isn't." <laughs> something to play around in and the, the physics are real wonky so it's like it's real easy to like accidentally click uh kick the bucket over and then the, all the blood you cleaned up goes spilling all over the floor again and if you're walking through the the gore on the floor you'll make little bloody footprints everywhere where people have already cleaned and stuff so nice 
but there's no time limit. There's no like objectives. You just, whenever you're done with the level, you just clock out and then it gives you a rating or whatever, how well you did. I didn't realize I wanted this game until I played the beginner's guide, which is a super pretentious art game, walking simulator yeah. thing. Uh -huh. um, and in the beginner's guide, one of these little level game things is you walking around and pressing E on dirty things and making them clean again, like, yeah. like making the bed or putting away dishes or books or whatever. And yeah. the game has you do that for like three minutes or so. But it was honestly one of the most relaxing things <laughs> I have ever done in my entire life. It was so fucking zen. So it Tom, was amazing. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to send me an envelope with 20 bucks. And I'll return to you instructions. <laughs> they will read, go to your kitchen, do the dishes, go to your bedroom, make the bed, grab your v vacuum, sweep the floor. But there's there's one one huge difference, though, and that's like I have to get off my ass and away from my computer to do that. With visceral cleanup detail, like I can go like full South Park World of Warcraft guy and just like hang back here and, and do my cleanup detail. And it would be great. It, honestly, it looks like just so fucking zen just put on some nice ambient music chill out and clean up like alien remains everywhere that's what i want to do for an hour uh, i would so never Tom, play this game by myself you are the embodiment of what old fuckers say is wrong with our society <laughs> oh, and I at know. this point i can't disagree <laughs> i totally i totally own that i totally admit it <laughs> uh, but um, so is this an early access or is this a full-fledged game <sighs> No, I mean it's it's out. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Wow. We we should totally all buy this it's and just, then stream the fuck out of it. It's thirteen dollars. It is not a good game. Um, but it can be fun if you're just messing around with your friends. You get in a big d Discord server with a bunch of people and you know whatever. But I would not recommend it <laughs> in any sense. I'm totally but if you, buy if you just got money you just want to throw away on Steam or you want to give somebody a joke game or something, it would be a pretty good one. So this sounds like something that our buddy d -Lies would end up buying and then we'd wake up the next morning during a Steam sale and have. Uh, yeah, think, he, uh, he gave yeah, me Train like Simulator that. and some kind of Sparkle Pony game or something. Yeah, And I <laughs> think he gave Tate Farm Simulator. Nice. 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 Tate gave me McPixel and it was terrible. <laughs> I actually played some of it and I was like, I don't need this is this is so bad. That's a trend we have to go back to. Yeah. Yes, the worst is. game <laughs> gift at Ward. Um, I'm, but, I'm gonna I'm gonna give him uh Dota 2. I think I've still got those beta invites. <laughs> oh god. Uh but uh, other than that, um I bought Firewatch finally. Oh really? This is something I was really Ooh. excited to play. I've been wanting to play it for a long time. Um I finally bought it. It was on sale. I think it's only ten bucks right now. Oh wow! So I thought, okay, I'll finally buy it. I played through just just a little bit of the the beginning sequences, and um, I'm definitely interested to keep going. It looks really cool. You're gonna have to let us know how that is because I'm I'm a little hesitant because some of the reviews mm -hmm. I've been reading like say it's it's amazing and then it all falls apart, and I I don't want to yeah. pay for a walking simulator that I'm disappointed in the ending with because it's kind of the whole point is to have uh, that great yeah. story. But I, I am a fan of the walking simulator. I will. Yeah, and then, and the, the dialogue and the voice acting is really, really solid. See, what I'm worried about with walking simulator type games with reviews is there'll be a lot of people who know the genre. They understand what the genre is. They buy the mm -hmm. game. They review it as like, this game's amazing. Then you get yeah. people who don't know what the fuck they're getting into and just say, this game right. looks cool. They buy it and they start off walking around like, oh, this is OK. I'm interacting mm -hmm. a little bit. And after an mm -hmm. hour, it's like, where the fuck's the game? Yeah. It's very much a story experience. You have to be ready for that. Did, yeah, did, I've you, guys, heard... did you guys ever play Gone Home? No. No. Okay. It was it was interesting. It, there was a whole lot of internet hate going on cuz, you know, gaming press absolutely loved it and then like gamers bought it, you know, Call of Duty people bought it and then they're like, "What <laughs> what the hell is this? I'm I'm in a house and I walk around and I I listen to audio tapes but what the yeah. fuck but it was enjoyable yeah, that, i didn't play this game but it sounds a lot like uh there's a game called virginia it's a walking simulator that i know got a lot of really good reviews but whenever the creator was interviewed with um one of the podcasts i listened to 
one of the guys like, yeah, that game just sounds terrible. Yeah. It's like, this does not sound enjoyable at all. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, they're, it, they're not games. They're interactive stories. That said, yeah, I yeah. do want to pick up Firewatch because I've heard yeah. very good things about Firewatch. Yeah, and it's on sale for 10 bucks right now, so it's a good time to pick it up. I think it's the cheapest it's ever been. I might Honestly, just have to do that. I say we pick it up, play through it, and do a um, Firewatch cast maybe sometime. Be a good yeah. time. That'd be cool. Because I know we have some better. people in the audience have played it. Uh, Vidabi, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, Vosbeck. Man, I've never said that name before. Vosbeck, Has played it Vosbeck. before. Vosbeck. Vosbeck. We'll go with know. Vosbeck. Vosbeck. I don't know. Vosbeck. Vosbeck. <laughs> Which one do you guys want to Vosbeck. call him? V O S Peck. Yes. Okay. V O S Peck. But Eric, what have you been playing? I'm I'm excited to hear yours. Yes, please. So same old, same old. Um, I was playing some uh, rocket. No, nope, sorry, you ran in too fast. You have been released from this mortal coil. <laughs> try, try it again. Try it again. What have you been playing? I'll, I'll get to that. So no, nope, nope, sorry, sorry. Try it again. You died again. <laughs> I've I've really gotten used to that. Um, but the mortal coil is overrated. So definitely got the standard Rocket League Factorio. Uh, been big picturing co-op uh, Overcooked. Nice. Still loving That's a it. good time. That's a great time. I love uh, we're to the final boss, so hopefully we beat Ooh. that tomorrow or tonight, something like that. What but, is the final boss? Is that a spoiler? Can I ask what the final boss is? Do people get no, pissed no, if they find out? It's, it's <laughs> pretty obvious. If think. anyone who's ever played it at all, or at least started the game, it's the guy from the start of the game. Remember, you get oh, sent big... back in time, oh, yeah. so you prepare for him. Okay. Was it the big meatball monster or something? Yeah, the big meatball, uh, the pecking. Okay. okay. The pecking. Pecking. Yeah. Pecking. <laughs> um, but and then the game I put the most time in this week. Sony has released their first one or their let's say the left jab of their one two punch this month. Neo has finally launched. Yes. This is a very anticipated title by Tim ne- uh, Tim uh, my god I can't talk. Team Ninja. Um it is very um Dark Soul esque. Heavy Japanese influence. It's what I would really put it as is like Dark Souls meets Gaiden a little bit with the pacing, meets mm-hmm. Diablo with the loot. So, for those unfamiliar, what other games have Team Ninja done? If you're not familiar with the developers, Ninja uh, Gaiden, they, Ninja Gaiden, and DOA are their big Dead or alive, two. Beach volleyball. <laughs> okay, fuck the okay. beach volleyball. But uh, their big two titles are Ninja Gaiden. And um, that was a series that started off really strong and ended fairly weak. It got worse and worse as it went. But also DOAs, which are really technical fighting games. And they actually had a one-off with Harul Warriors, which is a Zelda-based Dynasty Warriors game. Hmm. But They also made Metroid Other M, which completely broke the Metroid series. And Nintendo will never make another Metroid game because of the, the horror that was unleashed by Team Ninja. Let me guess, that was incredibly difficult. No, it wasn't. Oh. It, was, it was boring. It was shitty. There was nothing to the game. So, uh, you, yeah. you don't want me to rant about other M. But from what yeah. we've under, understood, they've definitely redeemed themselves with Neo. Yes. yes. So, this game is so far so good. I'm sitting at about four hours in right now. Um, it is very brutal so in this game if you make one mistake you're dead even on nice. regular regular units i'd walk into sometimes i'd be hasty tom saw it i think you saw it a few times on the stream mm-hmm. where i would run in way too fast and the guy starts his combo on me hits on his very first hit i can't recover from that and i'm dead i go from full health to dead in just one series with this guy nice um they have what um, they call them shrines. They're checkpoints. It's like bonfires and souls. Um, you're fighting to get to those points is what happens. They are stationed through the level to help you progress. Once you get to that point, if you die, you go back to there. So it's okay. like your checkpoint that you just want to fight for. It, you're not going for the end of the game. You're going just for that next goddamn checkpoint. So you don't have right. to fight this one guy by that fucking building 10 times in a row so you can get killed by this boss over here. Yeah. Um, other now, are they are they staged out pretty well? Like after 
After you complete an area, is there a shrine like right outside? No. Are, are, not are, there, all the time. are there lots? Okay, okay. I was wondering if they did the same thing Dark Souls did, because in Dark Souls, when you beat an area, there might not be a bonfire there. There might be, but there might not be. And then you yeah. have to weigh the balance of do I backtrack and do all that shit all over again, but I save, or do I press forward and take the chance of dying and losing all this progress? So, uh, yeah, there's not always going to be a shrine. And uh, I'll point out a mechanic right here that'll help explain what Tom was getting into. Um, you get your currency when you kill people. If you die, you drop a grave. You get one chance to get back to your grave. If you get back to your grave without dying, you recover your currency. If you die again, you lose the currency from the first grave. Okay. So you could, if you end up dying to the same spot over and over again, what ends up happening is you get this huge amount of currency at this one spot. So you pick it up and then die, pick it up, then die. But you're establishing currency the entire way to there by killing all these enemies. Oh, I see. So I had a moment last night where I really worked up a lot of currency. And then I just fucked up against a very small, weak guy at the very beginning. And it, that was game over for me. I was done. So do you think that mechanic can be exploited to it's a grinding duplicate next. your currency? You, it's not duplicated. So what happens is, let's say there's two guys and mm -hmm. you got 20 currency for them and then you died. So now there's 20 currency in your grave. You fight your way back to them, kill those two again. You got 20 and then you pick up your 20. There's 40. But the next yeah. time you only get 20 and you pick up your 40. So you got 60. So here's why okay. It's, okay. that's not exploitable. And here's kind of why. When you reset to the shrine, the guys respond to your gold. Let's say you pick up your gold, you run back to your shrine. At the shrine is where you exchange this currency for levels and mm -hmm. skills. So you buy your skills. You don't buy items, you buy skills. So you power your person up, but as soon as you touch that shrine, what happens is all the bad guys in the map respawn. Okay. So that's what Tom was saying about after you get so far, you have so much currency. Do you want to go back and use that currency and have to do all of that over again? Or do you push forward to the next shrine, not knowing where that is? Hmm. It and is there, there could be that one guy you fuck up on and you die anyway and lose that stuff. And then you've got to go all the way through again with the chance of dying again and losing the stuff that you could recover. It's an interesting dynamic. It, it really is. And it can actually be stressful sometimes. Because it oh, can yeah. take you 20 minutes to get past a point. You do it. And then you're like, well, fuck, I have a shit ton of currency. Do I want to save this? Or do I want to push forward because I don't want to have to do that again? What's nice, though, is after, after you die a couple times and you know, you've lost everything, you, you're at a zero, there's no recovery, you have the option. That it's basically, it's, uh, the game exposes it to you naturally you are totally open to suicide runs. So if you get to a new area and you've died a whole bunch and you've got nothing left to lose, quite literally, you can run in like a suicidal banshee to scout out the area, find out where the people are, and then plan your attack from there. Um, you know, knowing full well you'll die. In Dark Souls, that's a pretty common tactic to scout out new areas. You're, you run in like a crazed man and you lose nothing, but, you know, you're wasting time. So there is this interesting mechanic I like about it. If you die, let's say that I use two healing elixirs and I threw a couple firebombs. I die, I don't get those back. They're still spent. So you, it's not like you're reloading a state. You're going back to the shrine and getting all your health back, but everything else stays the same with you. So that's good if you picked up loot, you still have the loot. That's bad if you used all your healing potions on a boss and still died, all your healing's gone. Mm. So, so when I'm talking about the consumables for Ornstein and Smo and Dark Souls, you know, I'm having to plan out my attack and plan out my strategy pretty carefully because if I use all my humanity, that's, that's it. I gotta go far more. But, you know, that's a whole backtracking and, and killing rats, essentially, to try to get this back on rare drops. Um, it's it, from what I've seen, Neo looks like I don't want to call it a carbon copy because it's not a carbon copy, but it's no, no, no. You haven't gotten deep enough in this. Uh, so I was just getting ready to explain that right there makes it sound like souls. And then you have the systems. The systems are what differentiate this. A, well, I think also um, 
The combat is very fast paced. You don't want to fight multiples at once. Two is about as much as you really want to do, but this combat mm-hmm. is incredibly fast. It yeah, the feels... combat, from what I've seen, it looks more offensive, less yes. blocking and waiting. It's yes. more ninja guy and less Dark Souls. Dark Souls is plotting, slow, methodical combat. Neo is ninja combat. Yeah, you, there is blocking, there is parrying, but you tend to do that only to be able to get the offensive strike. You are very much balls to the wall on the offense. I'm sure you could play it more defensive, but it seems mm-hmm. to be very fast, very combo-based, get in their face and kill them quick. Which um, is kind of par for the course for a Team Ninja game. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the, some of the mechanics that are really cool is the tech tree. The tech tree is very big. You have a tech tree per weapon. And then underneath that tech tree per weapon, you have different techs you can get per stances. So it allows you to splinter it out fairly deep. And uh, there's this combo list where let's say one of the techs you bought said after a light, light, light combo, you hit heavy. Instead of doing a regular heavy hit, you will now do a roundhouse kick that will stun them. And then let's say you also now have uh, unlocked a light, 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 heavy combo that actually retreats for you while you get the last hit. Well, you have a conflict now. You have two different light, light, light heavies. Mm -hmm. You can go into this list and say which one you want to take precedent over the other. So you get to kind of customize your combinations after you unlock multiples of them. Hmm, That's cool. And that's per weapon? Yes. So, so are those are those permanently stamped down me. or or can you flip them out? I have not discovered if I can respec. I have not seen anything okay. that yeah. seems to be respecable. That's something that would worry me because you might go through a bunch of the game with one weapon and get it upgraded nicely, but then if you get a different weapon that you like way better, it feels like you might have wasted all of that that upgrade ability. Now, yeah. keep in mind, not all of these are always um some of these are cross. It's weird to say, yeah. like, some of these abilities, I have two of them, like, um, light, 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 round kick. Um, that mm-hmm. works for my spear and my uh, double twin swords. But I only had to get it once, and it worked for both. So okay. there are some similarities like that. It's not all the way lost. And these abilities, right. while useful, you can do it without them so far. Okay. Hmm. But it's really cool. So, like, um, with my twin swords, I got the roundhouse. With the spear, I chose to not do the roundhouse, and I have an option where I can do a heavy afterwards, and I actually hurdle my opponent to get on the backside of him. And then on my little swirly thingy, I don't know what it's called, I have, like, a retreating hit. So you can build up all these different weapons to where you be able to fight them completely different. Nice. Sounds like there's some depth then. And it's off the tech tree, and let's say you're playing defensive, all of a sudden you want to switch it, you literally just adjust that combo and you're switched. Hmm. You can go ultra offense Hmm. just by switching the combo. This sounds like it's Gaiden Souls. It sounds like the the best version of Ninja Gaiden Black mixed with Dark Souls. um, Mixed with Diablo loot. So when you kill Hmm. people, you get random drops. And these drops are purely random where it'll be the same. So like in most loot games, you have brands of items. Like for a bastard Mm -hmm. sword, you might have a um, steel bastard sword. And you might have a mithril bastard sword. Or you might have a guard's bastard sword. Or that brand for a bastard sword. So in this game, it's random what you get out of that. I think per level, maybe you're restricted to where you can only get guards this and steal that on this level. But inside of that drop you get random attributes on the weapon as well so like you might get one where your kai falls slower in close quarters combat with this sword but your damage might be a little less so you have interesting you get all these different boosts on the weapon randomly and also with the random mechanic that i know is not in souls is something called um familiarity and you build familiarity to a precise weapon, not a type. Like, you have a bastard sword to get max familiarity with. It doesn't go across all bastard swords, just that one. And that will grant you a little bit of damage bonus. And then some of these random traits will also say, with max familiarity, you will get a bonus of 10 or 11% more damage. So these systems are super deep. I'm still very, very much at the beginning of this game, so I can't imagine how deep these systems are going to get. 
But as of right now, it is it is balls to the wall, offense, speed, and me dying a fuck ton. <laughs> so, but when when you die, and it, it sort of looked like this. Like every time you died, because I've been playing Dark Souls for a little bit, and I'm not great at the game, but I know when you died, Neo, I could see exactly what you did wrong, and I knew it was entirely your fault. And from the way you were yelling at it, you knew it was entirely your fault too. But <laughs> does does Neo ever kill you cheaply? Dark Souls doesn't. Every everything, every little death and every trap is telegraphed to you. You have to look for it. But every time I get killed in Dark Souls, it's because I'm being stupid. So does, does Neo share that? There may be some spots where you die once because you weren't ready. Like I had a roof collapse on me. It was just one spot of a roof that was a trap that you could not tell. And it just boom, it goes. Oh, but okay. that said, there was no damage from it. There was a guy in there, and it wasn't like he instantly jumped you. You can actually okay. hear that you startled him as well. So there's hmm. time for you to react. But, I mean, that was kind of a cheap, like, hey, what the fuck are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Keep and, me on your toes. And archers. Archers are such a pain in the ass. When you get up on them, you kill them quick as hell. But it's hard to get to them because, I mean, they're shooting at you while you're trying to run at them. Mm. Running at a person I'm in the crosshairs of is not something I want to do. I mean, you're just giving them a straight line shot. So you have to balance zigzag versus running at them. So it gets, they feel like they might be a little cheap. But other than that, yeah, it's, oh, fuck, I shouldn't have ran straight into them. I should have kind of strafed to the side and then attack kind of thing. So we've been seeing a ton of games that are, that are sort of following this trend line. Uh, the, you know, Souls-like games. We've seen it with Salt and Sanctuary, Bloodborne, a host of 2D games, uh, Neo now, and there are even more coming out that sort of follow this same trend line. I don't think it's a bad thing by any means, but... No, I think it's a good thing. So you know, what... it's... I, I don't want this to turn into the World War II shooter or the modern military oh, shooter no, no, of no, no, this no. generation. Yeah. No, no, so I think you're looking at it from the wrong spell. Look back at the mid-90s. There wasn't a such a thing called a first-person shooter. They were called Doom clones because there wasn't a name That's for true. the genre yet. That's true. Yeah. This is a genre. It's like an it's an action RPG at its most brutal point. There yeah. is no yeah. genre for this right now. That's so true. Everyone call Dark Souls is way more RPG than I was getting in The Witcher, which kind of amazed me because I I bought yeah. Dark Souls to be my offset to The Witcher. So I had my my hardcore RPG and I had my my stupid action game, or so I thought. And then I tried <laughs> to equip a weapon, and it's like, dude, you don't have the proper D&D stats to wield this. I'm like, what the fuck, Dark Souls, really? And then I started reading up on it, and holy shit, it's an RPG. So luckily, there's none of that in Neo. But um, okay. it's more, um, you find it, you use it. There is mobility penalties oh, cool. and stuff, but you find it, you use it. But yes, this genre, I mean, it's starting to be fleshed out. Dark Souls laid the groundwork for it. Very much so. It is the father of the genre. There's no disputing that. But I think that all the games following this are going to get painted in a bad light until people realize this is just a new genre. This isn't cloning. Yeah. This is the equivalent of, well, honestly, Wolfenstein is not the right example, but Duke Nukem to Doom. You wouldn't call Duke Nukem a Doom clone now necessarily, but at the time, yeah, that was what first-person shooters Definitely. were branded as. That's true. That's a good point. This is called a Dark Souls clone because there's nothing else to call it. When you get into this game, it's not Dark Souls clone. It is a beautiful right. marriage of Dark Souls kind of the genre, but they're bringing in the pacing and ninja guy, and they're bringing in looting from Diablo. They're bringing in a super deep tech tree, and they're reducing some of the D&D elements. So, I mean, it's, it's, yes, right now we're calling it Dark Souls, but so it's, not we, it's not going to be known that in five years. Do, do we want to take a stab here at, at being pioneers of the game industry and name this genre? I mean, I'm sure it won't stick. I'm also sure we won't get it right. But do you guys want to take a stab <laughs> at naming the Souls-like genre? The Suicide uh, RPG. I, I, I'm going to call it, uh, well, ARPG already. Souls-like isn't bad, but ARPG we still already have exists. Roguelikes. 
That's true. We that, still have roguelike. That's actually a very good point because rogue is a game. Yes, it's, but it's no longer known for that. That's not the, yeah. that's not in the same vein as saying Doom. Doom will yeah. carry weight for decades still. Yeah. But either either way, I think Souls like whatever you want to call them games. I think it's a good thing because yeah. it's promoting difficulty which yes, I well, love difficulty in games. There's there's a huge difference in in games just being hard as fuck and and yeah. being rewardingly difficult right and, and dark souls hits that balance and that's perfectly. yeah that's it's, what i'm talking about yeah it's one every time you die it's not cheap everything was telegraphed you died because you got greedy and you thought you could get that one more hit on the big fire spider and you knew you couldn't but you tried it anyway and you got fucking punished <laughs> for it and now you're dead you yeah. see that's a frustrating thing to me is people calling this a souls clone especially because of difficulty and stuff when that has been a mainstay for team ninja since they've been making fucking action games ninja gaiden was known for being brutal as fuck if you make one mistake if you oversee your welcome on a boss you're dead well the issue with ninja gaiden is it, it was pretty punishing it wasn't this rewarding, challenging difficulty that Dark Souls was. I, I think th the Team Ninja games tend to fall on the wrong side of that line, where they're they're frustratingly difficult. It, well, um, I don't like I, that's what I'm liking. It's like the you fucked up. The game's not being unfair. You just fucked up. You can do this. Don't be dumb. Get good. Yeah, I, I <laughs> felt the game was fairly unfair in certain parts of Ninja Gaiden, yeah. which is which is why it wasn't you know one of my favorite games. Uh, v Dobby proposes a fantastic name to this genre, which is Soul Suckers, and I am totally <laughs> down for this. That is wonderful. I could absolutely see if that. If that was to catch, I would be happy. Yeah, I would be very happy <laughs> I'm, calling them Soul with Suckers. That. But so that Neo, is all. We've got a fuck ton of news. Holy yes. shit, everything happened in like the past two days. <laughs> so uh, quick, what, anyone else have anything else they want to throw out there on Neo via the um, Twitch chat, you guys? Because I will, full disclosure, I plan on trying to clip together some stuff, get a review up on Neo, hopefully by the end of this weekend, Monday, Tuesday at the latest. So it looks good. Um, if, if I can offer a piece of advice, when you're charging in, Charge in, get two hits max, and then just run the opposite direction. Just back out. Just do this run in, hit, run away, run in, hit, run away. Yes, it takes a while, but it's the safest option. If you're sitting there and trying to tank these hits, you're a samurai. You're not a guy in armor. What, what are you doing? Irk, you, you just gotta, you gotta play like a ninja, man. Come on. Actually, I'm in heavy armor. Oh, you're in heavy armor now. Okay. Okay. And Before you were in like basically a bathrobe with a sword. And so also <laughs> one thing I want to get at, there's two different types of enemies. You have your standard human enemies, and then you have these nether realm type enemies. Human enemies, you hit them, they don't attack because they got to recover from the hit. Nether realm enemies, when you attack, they don't care. They're still Ooh. going to hit you. So it is seriously a hit, hit, bounce, hit, hit, bounce. Okay. I did see a couple of those. I love the the fantasy Japanese mythological style yes. or whatever. An ogre samurai cool. pretty much. Yeah. Yes. The the semi the old school uh demon Yes. Demons and stuff. Yeah. The um anyone who goes to play this, I think you'll be very pleased with the ogre samurai in this, the semi bosses that appear. So this is PS4 exclusive, right? Yes it is. Okay. Okay, I was, Which is, I was wondering if I had to prep for a PC release, but I guess not. I guess it's, it's sharing the Bloodborne spotlight on the PS4. And it feels weird to me because Ninja Gaiden doesn't, it's not like Naughty Dog. It's not an owned company. This is a nice mm -hmm. big game. As popular as the Souls games have been, I don't know why they locked. I don't know if it was because this was started, this mm -hmm. game was in progress like back in 2004. I don't know if at that point the development company that had it was locked in with Sony, but they've never had an exclusivity deal with exclusivity deal with Sony before. So I don't um, know why this is. I'm wondering if there's going to be like a game of the year edition that gets re-released, kind of like 
you know, all the Tomb Grand Theft Autos got re-released on the Xbox, and then of course, you know, Tomb Raider, Raider recently. So hey, it's not just me. Tomb Tomb, tomb Reader. Reader, Tomb Reader. You go, you go to all the tombs and read all like the nice dialogues about the person's Scholastic life. Scholastic presents Tomb Reader, <laughs> <laughs> the Schools best will. in edutainment games. Guys, can, nice. can we kickstart that? Can Excellent. that be a thing? Yeah, go ahead. So, Math the Blaster, Scholastic Tomb Reader, Tomb Reader, and Math Blaster. Sounds like yes. a stellar combo. <laughs> Why don't we bring Math Blaster back? I fucking love Math Blaster. Frog Fractions <laughs> is kind of like that at times. So check it out. It's free. I should flash. play Frog Fractions. Yeah. Okay, so we do have a little bit of news. Um, a <laughs> little bit. A little bit. A little bit, a lot of news. So um, I think the first thing we'll start off with is Netflix has a new series that they're going to be making. Yeah. And it's a series that we had <laughs> such a debate on a couple weeks ago. Uh, what's wrong Tom? castlevania uh, i don't know how i feel about this it's castlevania i love it castlevania seems like, seems like but, such a weird thing to do a series on right like when has castlevania last been relevant uh i mean every single castlevania game that comes out that's 2d not 3d because those castlevania games don't exist um have been amazing i mean you know the they took Metroid, and then they updated it, and they made Symphony of the Night, and they essentially renamed a genre the Metroidvanias, because that's that's level design now is a Metroidvania style level design. That's a genre. That's there's see, a reason these games the are issue. so awesome. Here's the issue: you're looking at gameplay. Gameplay doesn't mean shit, man. We're talking TV. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So Symphony of the Night had a decent story, but that said, it's a video game story. The Castlevanias are always campy as shit. So good news. Uh, you're you're is... a guy named Belmont. You have a whip and you're hitting Dracula with a whip inside of a castle full of like skeletons and weird mythological creatures. The good news is, from what I've heard, the company that's taking this on is an animation company. They're the ones who brought you Adventure Time, is what I've heard. So it should be sounds like it's good chance it's going to be animated, which I think would be best because I think a real life yeah. ca- Castlevania yeah. would look bad. Yeah, no, no. And echoes hope- of Castlevania sixty four. And hopefully <laughs> this gets rid of all this little vampires aren't bad things. It gets back to like the brood of the evil. The vampires suck. Yeah. Kill all vampires. Oh my god. Yeah. Fucking in in Castlevania does the perfect job with with dracula i mean he's he's not this you know pansy little vampire who sparkles in the sunlight i mean he he sucks blood and kills people for fun and he's fucking dracula man um but yeah castlevania uh, in in the recent games they have had anime cutscenes they've always had sort of an anime ish art style to the games uh Mm -hmm. but in recent games they've actually had anime style cutscenes in them so Mm -hmm. i could see this working out potentially good that said it's a video game series made by anyone on anything. I don't care who's making it. There's a huge yeah. chance this is going to be dog shit. Right. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we will we will keep you apprised. And I will be binge watching as much as I can of the Castlevania series when it hits Netflix. So you can see the review here first. Probably not first, but you can see it here eventually on the 72 pin <laughs> connector podcast. <laughs> Woot. Uh, and in other news, we have some Rocket League stuff. Um, actually, kind of a lot of Rocket League stuff. Yeah, Rocket League's been in the um, news. Yeah, they've got a couple of big updates coming up. Um, uh, one of the minor updates, but it's a cool one, is a Hot Wheels DLC cars. I'm excited. This is such a natural fit for this game. I cannot believe this didn't happen sooner. This right, is yeah. awesome. <laughs> so the update hits February 21st. Um, two of them. There's the the Twin Mill 3, which is one of the older Hot Wheels designs. It's been around forever. It's a classic. And then Bone Shaker, which kind of looks like an old hot rod. So uh, skull be, on it. Yeah. $1.99 a piece. Um, comes with exclusive wheels. The one nice thing I did like. customizable. That right there. So yeah. um, I like the Batmobile. The Batmobile is a sweet car. You can't do yeah. shit with it. And the boost sucks. Yeah. Well, they're licensed in that yeah. way. At least these are Hot Wheels are already kind of they they've got different ones. You know, it's not the one iconic 
you know, paint job or whatever. Yeah. But the nice thing so, is this will give me the Batmobile hitbox in a car yeah. that I can make my own. <laughs> being being a Rocket League, League noob, um, during the Steam sale, I saw for like a buck or something, I could get yeah. uh, the DeLorean from Back to the Future. Yes. I was like, fuck yes. yes. And I get the DeLorean and I'm like unlocking like trails and, and toppers and decals and yeah. everything because it's Rocket League and you just unlock shit all the time. I'm like, right. fuck yeah, but the apply button's grayed out. I was like, what the fuck? So I look, yeah. I can't do anything to that car. I it's bought this car. car. <laughs> I, I want to. I want to gotta... put shit on it. I want to put a sombrero on top of my DeLorean, but it won't <laughs> let me do that because Doc is anti sombrero. Yeah, but, but so is Bruce Wayne. Yeah, right. I, uh, uh. It it sucks, but you know, licensing you kind of understand that. But for the Hot Wheels, you can so get you a twin mill three with a nice oversized foam cowboy hat. And a foam um, <laughs> finger. <laughs> yes. Um, other than the Hot Wheels um, update, they have announced RLCS Season 3, which starts in March. Um, this is the official developer-backed, Twitch-sponsored giant tournament thing. Prize pool has been up to 300000 um, which isn't a whole lot more than last season's 250000 But it's on the but, incline. That's a big thing. Yes, it's on the incline. Um, they're adding a new region, so people from the Oceanic region can now compete. So Australia, New Zealand, and whatever else might be down there. I'm That's fantastic. Ge- ge- geographically ignorant. So I want to know if they're going to tie Asia into that, or if they're going to still say there's not enough player base in Asia for us to worry about. Uh, I, I think if it included Asia, they would have kind of advertised that. Because, I mean, in all other major esports, I shouldn't say it like that. I'm used to Dota mm-hmm. and League. There's a in Starcraft yeah. and stuff. There's a huge Asian influence there. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think it's it's the the scene isn't as big as in Asia as it is the o- oceanic region, which is kind of surprising to me. Yeah. That um, it's not in Asia. That doesn't surprise me too much. It just surprised me that there's enough in Australia and like New Zealand and that yeah. shit. And I don't think they had Asian servers on launch too. I think that came later. Oh, so okay, that, that makes probably sense. didn't help. But um, yeah, it starts in March, and on top of all of that, they are pouring more money into esports. This is the big one. More than two point five million dollars into Rocket League esports. So here's a list of the things they're going to do. More than one million is going to total prize pools, including the RLCS. So they're also going to be funding the community run tournaments more. Which is Um, like what RSL, REL, or what is it? They're like weekly uh, things. ESL. Well, you've got you've got ESL, you've got uh, Shift Pro League, you've got Nexus, you've got PRL. There's all kinds of them. Um, bigger, more meaningful appearances at multiple major competitive gaming festivals, on-site events at those uh, gaming conventions like PAX, SXSW, and more. Um, you know the funding of the community tournaments. Expanded weekly tournament support in multiple regions, including Europe, North America, Oceania, South America, and more. A true collegiate Rocket League esports program. Hmm. That's interesting to me. I did yes. not realize that esports is turned into a collegiate thing. Yeah, that's... Yeah, I don't know. Odd. I wonder how long that'll last. I wonder not how sure. many schools are going to support that, because a lot of people that are really good at video games probably don't spend a whole lot of time on homework. I I might I might go back to school. <laughs> but I'm gonna go be go be a, a professional esport guy. Yeah. <laughs> and also a new series of tournaments for the Xbox community, um, and an a new weekly talk show on Twitch that covers all things RLCS. So we're turning yeah. into ESPN. <laughs> that is, I'm I'm all for it and enhance yeah. the whole pro scene. I think it's good. Get behind yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, a, a robust new esports hub on the Rocket League website, ongoing charity tournaments, and numerous in game esports features and enhancements. That one has me intrigued. Yeah. I wonder what they're going to do. In game. So maybe like online leagues to play? In-game? That would be cool. That would be kind of cool. Maybe a actual game recognized team function. Yeah, where you can form maybe. teams with alternates and stuff like that. 
And actually, that would That'd actually be, cool. be kind of cool because I mean, back Halo Two style clans, where you mm -hmm. actually have clan ladders. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I yeah, can totally see that being used as you know something to springboard people into the esports scene. Like, hey, right. this guy's the number one player in you know North America. He should probably find a team. <laughs> yeah, a nice, nice ability to get scouting done. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and also uh, Vidabi brought in something else that's really big for esports you might throw in. Uh, games like Dota and that allow for um, watching. Um, oh, yeah. They may actually put something in game to allow you to watch tournament games in the actual that game. That would be really oh, yeah. cool. That would be nice. That would be really good. Control the camera, get your own replays, get yes. your own slow motion. Yeah. Oh, All they have to do is just awesome. involve two servers, server for the game, shoot it over to a mm -hmm. second server where you just let fuckers go watch. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be really, really cool. So is that is that all the Rocket League stuff we have? So far, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm so, sure we'll get more tomorrow. So there's uh something you hit on there I'll do a quick shout out about. You said about how they're wanting to get to more trade shows. Everyone yes. can get to more trade shows now, even though technically you probably could have anyway. E3 is officially opening their doors for public, even though really it's kind of been public the whole time. Yeah, the, the barrier to entry for E3 has always been, I won't say always, it got stupid low. Basically, if you had a blog that you sometimes posted game reviews to, you could apply and get access to go buy a ticket to get to E3. So, for, for instance, 72 Pin Connector was allowed to buy E3 tickets at one point in time. We didn't because they were expensive and we were poor college students, but that's how low the barrier to entry is. They were about to let me in the door. <laughs> but yeah, so it's open to the public. It is good. It should have been the entire time. Yeah. They're allowing, what, like 4,000 tickets to be sold. So it's not a huge amount. Um, everything I've heard from people in the industry is... Be ready to wait. That even yes. when it was industry only, they would wait in line three hours to play a new game. Yeah, it's play so, a 10 minute demo of a new game. I'm worried right. that people are going to go there expecting something more hands on than what it really is. Right. Yeah. Especially since uh, E3 has been losing its luster for a while now with events yeah. like PAX and South by Southwest. And then you got like the EA experience, PSX. Microsoft has their, like all these public the, or the private Final Fantasy experience. I think Square's which, got their own trade show now, which is good. I like the individual developers yeah. having their own thing. Oh yeah, definitely. I I think E three hopefully will eventually be parlayed into an indie display. I'm hoping, but PAX has always kind of filled that role for the indies. Well, at it's least great. In, in previous yeah. years, the E3 more the would better. Be more for the AAA, wouldn't it? Well, it always has been, but AAA are starting to do their own things. Where EA is a formality now, if they even do yeah. it. I I have have really really mixed thoughts and mixed feelings on E3 in general. I I used to get super excited for E3 and watch all the coverage and get hyped, and it's it's just the whole thing is spectacle without substance to me. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of shit being shown off, and maybe maybe two percent of it is even going to come out that year. And then you know half of that, so one percent is actually going to be decent enough to buy. Uh, and, and, and not not to mention from a developer's point of view, putting on a demo or or a pre-rendered trailer takes a bunch of time, effort, and money, and, and takes time, effort, and money away from developing your actual fucking game, the thing that you know you're supposed to be selling to people. And you take all that and you put it into this E3 demo, which may or may not flop because you may or may not be bookended by like shovelware titles. So you might not even get the audience you're looking for, but you just spend a whole shit ton of money to make a great first impression. And then all your shit crashes and then your demo has a bug in it and people can't play it. And then you're like, fuck, we just spent $10 million putting on a shitty demo and then $20 million flying the team out here. What the fuck? So E3 is a giant money sink for developers. And I don't think it's a good idea unless you're AAA. So something for you to think about. You just threw out a double edged sword because you just condemned demos because they cost money yet went on a tirade about how more developers need to make demos. Yes, no, no, I, I totally agree, and it is a double-edged sword, and, and there's an extra credits episode about this, 
developers are actively disincentivized from making demos. So let me give you the quick overview because this is 72 pin connector and we can detour the fuck out of this. All right. So <laughs> let's say you've got a great game and you make a great demo. This is fairly hard to do because making great games isn't like the easiest thing in the world, right? People play your demo and you might get some increased sales, right? So that's that's good. You've got a great game and you make a shit demo. Well, people are going to play the demo and say, wow, that was fucking awful. And then they're going to get away from that. They're going to not buy it at all because they assume the whole game shit when the whole game's actually pretty great. What mm-hmm. if you make, you know, a mediocre game and a great demo? That's hard to do. People might wait to see. Uh, or, or a bad demo. Basically, the way it ends up working out is in the majority of cases, a demo will convince people to either wait for reviews or not buy the game at all. There's a bigger chance of them being disincentivized from buying your game than incentivized to buy it. It hurts developers to make demos. I think from a consumer point, yes, everyone should have demos all the time. From a business standpoint, demos make no sense at all. And rant. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. <laughs> I was just saying, like, <laughs> parlayed. Um, I did want to throw one more thing out there about E3 beforehand. Uh, v Dobby brought something up. I can't remember the company, but he's absolutely right. Um, I wanted to say it was EA, where um, they had a main stage appearance. They didn't say shit. And then three months later, they announced a game. A very big <laughs> game. So E3 is a joke it's a placeholder and it's there because it's supposed to be there not because it needs to be there yeah but you know we'll see e3 has been trying to reinvent itself for a few years now and i I don't want to give up on it because there is something fun about you know watching the hype train come through every year so we'll see and actually real quick before we get off the you know the scene and we had some pro talk there is some really cool esports news nba the National Basketball Association is getting behind an esports league. What they are planning on doing is having a NBA 2K basketball league that each NBA team would sponsor a 2K esport team and they would compete through the season and have a playoffs alongside the NBA the entire way. This is fucking weird. Wow. <laughs> And there, I wanted to give you guys a second to say that because there's even weirder. So, kind of cool because they're treating it for real. Um, they'll be paid. This isn't prize pool. This is actual pay. As so, they win it all. They don't get any extra. It's just like actual professional sports. Maybe a bonus in the contract or something. But there's going to be training oh. camps and stuff for them that they have to go through after they get on their team to work with the team to get used to the team. They're treating it like real professionals. And there's even going to be a potentially a draft to draft the teams. Huh. I have a couple of things to say on this. First off, that's an excellent way to approach getting uh, uh, esports started for a game. Uh, secondly, it's cool to see a big organization of real sports get into esports as well. Yes. Especially if they're going to be pouring money into it and doing it right from the start. And my third point is, why NBA 2K? So, <laughs> so I, when they, is, they, that, is that even like a, is that even a popular esport? Well, they, they, that, they can't do they can't do college ball because they don't play they don't pay the players who play college ball anyway. Well, and so. NBA 2K is the premier basketball game, and actually, this last one is seen as possibly one of the best basketball games ever made, outside of NBA Jam, in my own personal opinion, but. Well, no, that's yeah. not a personal opinion. That's a fact. <laughs> but yeah. um, it's yes, it feels weird because this is not a game I see as a huge esport. But no, the NBA has always been forward thinking. And this honestly could just get some more attention to esports. I don't know yeah. how it's going to do. So but really, is... if it costs each team about uh, two hundred thousand dollars a year, that's next to nothing compared to their salary caps. How does this end up working? So if you're if you're an esports pro playing for an NBA team, an NBA esports team, do they like make all players and teams in game all the stats genericized? Do they just like level the entire playing field? Because if I'm playing, you know, the esports equivalent of LeBron James 
and someone else is playing the esports equivalent of Tom Webster in a basketball game, you know, they're going to get their shit rocked purely based on stats alone. I think that's pretty unfair. But here's where it gets interesting, because you know who your boss is, the owner of the team of the team you're playing in the game. If your team sucks there, it's because your management on the actual NBA side sucks. It's a really cool concept where the GM in real life makes the EA or the esports players better by improving the real team. I'm I'm going to and and these have typically been wrong on this show but I'm going to make a 72 pin prediction um and say that this will last 1 year before it, the program is shuttered. Oh yeah, it it sounds really off, but there's some really cool shit that could happen because that parallel to real life is awesome that no other esport has. I'd like to see this become, you know, something more. I'd like to see this succeed, but I don't see how it could. Oh, and also, I forgot to say this. Are you ready for the weirdest fact of all? From the oh, rumor mill, weirder. The rumor mill, mill right now. When you play NBA games, you play one person per team most of the time. Occasionally, you'll have a second person. They are talking about having five man rosters, so every player on the court is controlled by a real player. Hmm. Think how fucking weird that would be. Huh. That would make more sense from an esports perspective, though. How are they going to handle it in every shifting meta? Um, are they going to like lower cooldown timers or, or nerf LeBron? I don't. <laughs> I don't know because, as V Dobby said, I believe it would be you play the team that owns you. So, like, yeah. let's say you're the Golden State's team, you have the most stacked team in the game. If you're the fucking uh, Charlotte Hornets team, you're fucked. But I, it's uh, not true. I don't know fault. how to feel about this. I really don't know how to feel about this. I this like seems, the, uh, there's this some really like good the things they're doing. There's some this, good this things. Is, are, this is marketing. This is all marketing is what this is. <laughs> no, it's not. They're going to lose money on this. This isn't marketing. Oh, no, no, no. The fact the fact that we're talking about it means their ad revenue just paid off. No, you have to realize this about the NBA from being someone that's not as close to sports. NBA is ultra progressive. They are an organization that is always trying new things. The NBA said to ESPN, fucking ESPN, we will not give you the rights to our games if you do not show WNBA games as well. Hmm. They are a very progressive kind of league. Adam Silver is doing things to that league that I think is going to be really good. Side note, but I think this is really cool. I don't think it's just for marketing, and I don't think it stands a chance of even making it a full year. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of praise. Like, like the plane just went up and up and up. and <laughs> I'm just being real. I would love to see it work because the idea of it's like yeah. Overwatch, paid players, not prize pools, but paid players. Yeah, that's huge. I haven't heard anything on that front either, and I'm really looking forward to, to what Blizzard's going to do with the Overwatch League. It, it'll be uh, interesting for sure, and hopefully that one works out. Yeah, yeah, I really hope so. Um, so we do have, we do have more news. Where's, where's kind of the one-off stuff we can, we can get out? Here, here's one. Uh, the Dark Souls community at large has decided to go back to Dark Souls 2. Uh, occasionally, the um, the community will get together and they'll say, hey, everyone, we're going to run through this Dark Souls game because Dark Souls is sort of a multiplayer game and sort of not. And it's always a better experience when you play with other people who are also playing the game sort of in the same realm and time that you are. It's, it's weird. Dark Souls is odd. Um, but uh, they're saying from February 25th to March 11th, uh, Dark Souls 2 will spring back to life is what they're planning on doing. So that's that's pretty cool. That's interesting, yeah, yeah. but yeah, nothing bad about that. I always find I mean, I know Souls isn't that old, but I always fear going back to nostalgia <laughs> soap games because they mm-hmm. tend to not hold up. Yeah, yeah and Dark Souls 2 is clearly the the most hated Dark Souls game out of all three of them. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it was not received well. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the main reason is that in Dark Souls 1, it, the world feels like it will carry on without you. The world just doesn't give a fuck about you or, or your batteries. 
Um, and it, it, it exists on its own. If you get in its way, it will kill you. But other than that, it carries on. You don't matter to existence itself. It's like real life. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Dark Souls 2, it, the world feels very gamey. It feels very centered around the player character, which is very, mm-hmm. it's a very anti-Dark Souls message. Whereas the message right. of Dark Souls 1 is you don't matter, you're insignificant, and you are nothing. Dark Souls 2's message is we hate you, go die. Which is a very jarring experience to go from one to the other like that. So, and there are other technical issues with the game, but yeah. yeah. Um, so, there's a ton uh, of Valve news, but before really we get to cool. Valve news, I, ah. I found, I found the, another thing. Um, so, 17 fucking years after this goddamn game came out, <laughs> someone discovered something in the game that no one had before, and it's not like cut content or digging through files. Donkey Kong fucking 64, no one had found, uh, there's like rainbow coins, like one of the hundreds of collectibles you can collect in Donkey Kong 64. It was hidden in a patch of grass, and one speedrunner would just like randomly pound at the ground. He's like, wait, what? It wasn't in strategy guides. It wasn't in game facts. No one has found it before that people have found on the internet. 17 goddamn years, and someone <laughs> found something that no one had ever found in Donkey Kong 64. That so, is incredible. This, this is raises just amazing. The, this raises the question. Why the fuck is anyone still playing Donkey Kong 64? I agree. Donkey Kong 64 is... <laughs> It's not shit. It's just not very good. <laughs> you know, no, I was going to say, it's not a terrible game, but it's by no means a game you go back to an N64 to fucking no. play. No, no God means. no. God no. And then you have to beat the original Donkey Kong Arcade to flip the Switch to do the thing. It's just, uh, uh, In uh. fact, but regardless, regardless of how good the game was, 17 years. Right? And right? it was never in any kind of strategy guide or anything. Yeah, it, it was. It was that the internet has been able to find. It has not been documented anywhere that they can find anywhere publicly, at least. Some seven-year-old's cartridge has a save state where he's already had it for like the last seventeen years. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's awesome. Still impressive. Very and we've impressive. already talked about Donkey Kong 64 too much this year, so that's enough. Yeah, so that's that's it. That's the last story. Even if they find, like, Half-Life 3 inside of Donkey Kong 64, we will not <laughs> mention it ever again. Um, all right, finally, some Valve news. Um, do we want to jump into Vive stuff or general Valve news? Let's start with Vive. Do the Vive first. Okay, yeah, all right, Vive first. So, uh, Valve opens up about VR plans. Uh, there is a great uh, article, uh, interview that uh, Gama Sutra did with Gabe Newell, where he talked about VR, what they're doing with VR, their future plans, and the Vive headset is going wireless. Um, Newell, hmm? mm, pump the mm. brakes, pump the brakes. Mm. What no. he said is he sees the next thing for the headset being wireless because. There's already add-ons this year, and potentially in 2018, another iteration on the headset. So, so it, he, it's a little, it's a little more. Yes, this will be a thing, than than speculation. Um, it, at least when Newell says stuff like that, it's generally a confirmed thing. Half Life yeah. Three confirmed. Um, you know, you, he said the number three is evil, so that's never happened. So he said, uh, my expectation is that wireless will be an add on in 2017 and then it will be an integrated feature in 2018. So if I could get rid of my VR tail, I would be so goddamn happy. And there's already technology for that. Um, yes. The one company's pretty big out there has two different power banks. One that fits on the headset and it gives you two and a half hours. The other is six hours. It's not on market and they're having heating issues with it. And it's the size that has to be in your pocket. So if I'm playing something like Job Simulator and I catch on fire and then my battery pack catches on fire, that just means more immersion. I don't see what the issue is here. Or you're playing like Battle Dome or something, you get shot in the back of the head and the pack explodes on the back of the head. Yeah, I, I see no issue with this. There's no problem. This is not a lawsuit waiting to happen at all. I never. Um, so uh, there's also the, probably the biggest news uh, is that Valve is making 
three full, not tech demo, not stuff like the lab, three full VR games. First party in-house published by Valve coming out for the Vive. It's happening. Three games. He said it. He said three. It's confirmed, guys. It's confirmed. <laughs> Dota VR. They can count. So this this is really, really cool. I cannot wait. Now, that said, it's Valve. It's Valve time. But man, when we're 75 and this podcast is still going on, you can come back <laughs> to the 72 pin connector holocast and get the reviews of those three retro VR games. Yeah, um, I think them making the actual VR games is a big deal. There's not enough full featured VR games on yeah. the for not even just the Vive in general. The only really good full featured games are on PSVR right now. And that's a shame because that is nothing near Oculus Vive style. Yeah. So the fact that they're doing this and by v- Gabe's own admission, he's against brick wall. So odds are what they release will play on Oculus as well. So this isn't just good for the vibe. This is probably going to be good for just VR in general, which yeah. really needs to happen. So so speaking of exclusivity and walls, um, Gabe, uh, let me let me find the quote uh, right now. Um, so g- give me just just a second. This is great radio. Are um, you trying to get to the point where he was talking about helping funding developers? Yes, yes, so, I'm trying to find the exact quote. So I'll paraphrase while you look. So in general, Gabe's saying that their Valve is trying to help people develop for VR. It is their wish to make VR as a platform succeed. That he sees it as either being a Wii or a DS. The DS, the thing no one thought would work, that was fucking amazing. Or the Wii, that his first time he got his hands on it, he thought it was unlimited potential that ended up not doing anything after Wii Sports. So, so here's here's yeah, his, his here's his quote. Um, he says uh, one conversation we've had with some developers is around how they manage their risk. Right. Uh, it's like you've got people building proprietary walled gardens who say, hey, be exclusive to us and we'll give you a whole bunch of money. And we're like, we hate exclusives. We think it's bad for everybody, certainly in the medium to long term. And I'd argue probably in the short term as well. Uh, he then went on to say, but we're happy to say to people, look. You need to figure out how, how to manage your risks so you can develop the title that you want to build. So let's have a conversation where we can help you manage your cash flow over the course of development so you can go and build the thing you want and, and get it out to the market and start getting money from where you should be, you know, which is from your customers rather than anybody else. We're perfectly willing to help people out with that. He continues. Uh, and then they say, well, does that mean we have to be exclusive to Steam or exclusive to the Vive? And he says, oh, hell no. Uh, you guys should be making the best decisions for your customers, not having somebody else steer that. That's when we have the conversations about that. It's usually around how do we pay the bills when we're building our next VR title. That's usually a pretty productive conversation, but it's really about smoothing out risk over the lifetime of VR investments. Basically, open VR and the toolkits that Valve has built, and now the funding that Valve is giving developers, they say exclusives? No, you don't even have to release this shit on Steam. If you want to use open VR and our funding to release something into the Oculus store just for that platform, do it. We don't give a shit as long as VR succeeds. Valve has got all of their eggs in this basket, and I couldn't be happier. It's good to hear. It's really good to hear. It's a very um, altruistic approach to it. The whole, we just want the platform as a whole to succeed. I don't but think there's is anything a- altruistic to this at all. This is 100% selfish. If people get hyped for VR, if great VR games start coming out for any platform, people are going to buy some VR shit. And well, it, he- it might be the Vive. Right? Here's, it, it'll here's probably what buy happens. games on Steam. I'm going to tell you this right now. If I'm a VR dev, dev, I'm telling you what I'm making it for. The PSVR. There is more headsets for the PSVR yeah. than Oculus and Vive combined. Yeah, that, yeah, that is definitely. where people are and that's what the risk is it he i know people would think that if you're going to make it you're trying to make it for all of them but if you're rushing and you just need to get it to market and you're only mm-hmm. focusing on one psvr is where i go first 
probably. Yeah. Yeah, it does have the most eyeballs, and I, I hate admitting that, but it does. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really, really, really excited because Valve is going to make goddamn full featured VR games, and I cannot right. goddamn wait. Um, but mm. yeah, we'll we'll have to see when if they come out in our lifetime before the heat death of the known universe. <laughs> And maybe we'll get them, but maybe, maybe there was some other news in Valve. Smaller news. Yes. Greenlight is being put to bed. It's going away for good. Praise the sun. <laughs> it's probably for the best. Yeah, definitely. It overstayed its welcome for sure. I haven't looked at it in a while, but from what I understand, it's a cesspool of garbage games. Yeah, I, I have gone through there occasionally. And it's mm -hmm. usually after someone posts, you know, a, a picture of their indie game, like, oh, that looks kind of neat. And they mm -hmm. say, hey, can you vote for this on Steam, uh, on Greenlight? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? And then I go through the rest of Greenlight. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> and it was such a good Smith. idea when it came out. Yeah, the, and the whole idea was to get Valve as far removed from the picture as possible. Because Valve's issue is, you know, they're a relatively small company. They've got less than 500 people working for them. They can't review every single game that someone wants to push on that platform, right? They can't interact with every single developer and set up every single developer account. So they figured, eh, right. we'll make an automated system where the community can decide. And that's a good thought. In reality, <laughs> turns out that it just means a whole lot of shit to wade through. So right. their alternative is actually, it's slick, but potentially dangerous. What they're mm -hmm. having people do is you have to go through an application process to get into Steam. And this application mm -hmm. process is going to be much like opening a bank account. They need a lot of information about the developer and or development company. It looks like they're going to be running possibly some financial information. And at the very end of this, there is going to be an application fee that as of right now has been rumored to range from $250 up to $5,000 to apply to have your game on Steam. This better not be expensive. Yeah. So I don't want to speculate too much on that because it's such a rumor. Yeah. Well, this, this was from the, still coming from them, but it wasn't yeah. that them saying these are the numbers. But the reasoning is not they want money. They're trying mm -hmm. to not get trash games submitted. Don't want joke right. content submitted. So potentially this could be something where you're a super small single person dev company. We only need $400 from you. Or yeah, this could be yeah. something where, you know, you're an indie company that's released some stuff. We want full five grand from you to make sure you're on the board with this. Right. So do you think that's something they're going to leave at the discretion on a case by case basis? Or do you think it's no. something where they're going to pick a flat application? I, I think it's going to be case yeah. by case because really? the, on the applications themselves, they're going to be able to get the information of the companies and then be able to adjust according to that kind of like a credit score and rates on a credit card. Yeah, I, I see it being similar yeah. to that. Maybe. I I see. So if their whole goal by killing off Greenlight and by making this new program is to get rid of the shit that's in Greenlight right now, I guarantee you the vast majority of that stuff wouldn't pass the the two hundred, let alone one hundred dollar price barrier to make a joke on Steam Greenlight and have people vote on it. Right? Uh, imagine imagine if every Reddit post cost you five bucks. Right. The vast majority <laughs> of shit Reddit posts would go away overnight. Yeah, um, I, don't, I mean that, I that said, it's it's a barrier to entry, right? So if I if I am in you know a country that's you know economically less powerful than the United States, right? If my dollar doesn't go as far as a U.S. dollar, and I have to pay two hundred and fifty dollars, you know that could be six months of salary. That could be a year of salary, depending on where I live in the world. That mm -hmm. could be an issue. Um, uh, that which I, I, I could see, you know, the sliding scale working for stuff like that, working in that benefit. That said, it's pretty easy to work around that system. If you're putting in the time to work around that system, you probably are not coming to the table with bullshit. I would really hope not. I would really hope not. I, I think even even at a hundred bucks, you can get rid of 90 percent of your problems. And that would be OK. I think that would fix the issue. Well, and in, in any case, in any case, I mean, we're killing off green light. 
which is, you know, good. We, we can all agree good. that that's a good yeah. thing. Um, yeah. And we're going to try to replace it with something better, which we can all agree. Yeah, that, that's a good thing, too. It's a good thing. The, the devil's always in the details, but, you know, yeah. we'll have to see. And you can be guaranteed we'll report on it here first at the 72 Pin Connector <laughs> podcast. Where news yes. breaks. Yes. It do breaks and then we break it further. Yeah. Do, yes. we, do we break things? <laughs> okay. We're breaking things now. Uh, so I think that's pretty much the wrap on the news. I think we do have a quick gaming fact for you. Oh, yeah. I've got one. What we got? So it, it's less of a, like an interesting fact and more of an anniversary. Oh. So today, today actually marks February 10th uh, as of this recording. Remarks a 20-year anniversary of a game. A very popular game. And I want you two to try to guess it real quick. Frog Fractions. So, 1997. Uh, don't, don't look it up. Don't use Google. Don't cheat. On the 12th, Mario Kart 64 released. Oh, no. My sources say the 10th Mario Kart 64 released in the U.S. When? Oh, in the U.S. Yes. Maybe mm. I had a different date. <laughs> but yes, I actually looked that up. Nice. Mario Kart 64. I never played much of it, but... Really? That was, oh, I played the fuck yeah. out of Mario Kart 64. <laughs> I played a good bit of Mario Kart, but 64 is what drew me in. I love yeah. Mario Kart 64. Uh, okay, all right, all right, all right. Favorite, favorite stage? On 64? Yeah. Wario Stadium. That's respectable. I like Toad's Turnpike. I like the traffic. <laughs> Not applicable because I don't really know them very well. <laughs> okay, we're defaulting you to Rainbow Road. No, yes. default okay. him to Luigi's Raceway. That's the default. <laughs> yes. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, and with that, I think that's pretty much all we're going to get for you this week. We'd love to hear from you. Let us know what you think, what you'd like for us to talk about. If you think that we said something blatantly wrong or idiotic, <laughs> just get at us. We have our fan mail at fanmail at 72pinconnector.com. You can tweet at us with the at 72 PC podcast. You can find any of our content at a later time on our YouTube channel, 72 Pin Connector. You can go to our website and see what we've been up to, new content at 72pinconnector.com. And in case you're listening to this via audio or on our YouTube channel, you can catch us live 10 p.m. Eastern time every Friday night at our Twitch page at twitch.tv slash 72 Pin Connector. And that is all we have for you this week. So until next week, game on. Bye. Game on.